Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics Chat. Today I'm speaking with Christina Grigaitite. Christina is a PhD student at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and uh, we will be talking about T cells and power loss. Christina, welcome to the podcast. I thank you for having me. Christina, tell us about yourself and about your background. Okay, um, so I did my bachelor's at University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and that was in neuroscience. And I also did a year abroad at UCLA, and uh, I worked in a couple of labs at UCLA and University of Edinburgh. Um, these were neuroscience labs, so uh, no coding, no nothing, just experimental neuroscience. And then I applied to a graduate program at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. They have their own uh, graduate school there called Watson School of Biological Sciences, and um, uh, got in and started my PhD there. Um, the program that I'm in is quite unique in the sense that it's not specific to any given field. It's just a PhD in biological sciences. Usually it's already limited to either neuroscience or immunology. So uh, the reason I'm mentioning it is because I was able to explore any topic in biology I wanted that was um, present at Cold Spring Harbor. And while my plan was to do neuroscience, I decided to do one uh, laboratory rotation in a computational lab. I had no coding background, no programming ex experience. So I just decided to do it to pick up some coding skills and then continue on with my neuroscience career. It so happened that I ended up joining that lab and um, my field changed from neuroscience to computational immunology. And um, the reason for that was just simply because I enjoy programming a lot and found the work interesting. And um, now I'm a fourth year PhD student in a computational lab over there. Pretty cool. So you just decided to try out programming and picked up immunology along the way. Yes, yeah, so it so happened that the project I ended up doing for my PhD was an immunology project. It was just what the lab was at at the time. And so you did a study. I'm not sure whether that's the, the same study as the, the project you were referring to, but you did this uh, study of a big sequencing project of, of lymphocytes. And uh, can you talk about the study and what motivated it? Yes, yeah, so that... Um was part of the project. Uh, that's actually the huge part of the project. And um, my lab, I'm in Mickey Atwell's lab at Cold Spring Harbor, and he uh, had a collaboration with a company called Juno Therapeutics. Um, they are now bought out by some other company. I'm not sure which one, but they had this new technology in their in their in their company where they were able to encapsulate a lot of cells in a high throughput manner in these emulsion droplets and barcode them and do single cell sequencing on them. Um, so they were interested in doing uh, these immune cells, T cells and B cells. And so uh, they use the technology to um, perform this high throughput sequencing on a huge number of uh, T cells and B cells. And we were interested in T cells so because of this collaboration, we ended up receiving that huge data. And this was the biggest throughput at the time, and I think still is today, um, although uh, I'm not entirely sure. But as far as I'm aware, this one is the biggest one. And so I was very fortunate to get my hands on this data. Um, the reason this data was so special is because of the way the T cell receptor is made. So the T-cell receptor has um, two chains, alpha and beta chain. And previously, most of the studies only did bulk sequencing rather than single cell. So because they did bulk sequencing, they couldn't recover the paired information. So they had their beta chains, but they didn't know which alpha chain paired with which beta chain. So in the end, they uh, only had half of the receptor. But because the 
beta chain is considered more complex than the alpha chain just because of the number of combinations that it could have. Uh, most of the scientists would only look at the beta chain and assume that that's a correct way of looking at the T-cell repertoire. Um, so what's special about our data is it's in such a high throughput, we have uh, around 200,000 alpha-beta pairs that already post-filtering, so those are high-quality sequences. And um, and the fact that we had the pair, pairing information, so we have both alpha and beta chains, and we knew which alpha and which beta paired together. Um, so because we had this opportunity to address the question whether the beta chain is an accurate way of looking at the TISA repertoire, we... Um, we formed a bunch of analysis on this data, and ultimately we show that uh, while it's not too far off looking at the beta chain alone uh, rather than the paired uh, T cells, we find that in some cases, most of the cases, independent of which question you're asking, it's actually much more accurate to look at the paired information. Could you walk me through the technical details of the analysis. So from this company, you get a uh, big, um, I'm assuming, fast Q file or something like that. Yes. So basically all, all the reads that you have. And uh, how do you proceed from there? So I assume the RNA that was sequenced wasn't pre-selected, right? So you have to extract these alpha and beta sequences from all the mRNAs out there, how do you do that? So actually, um, I forgot to mention this, but this is targeted sequencing. So we did not have to extract it. It was already targeted to these alpha and beta chains of the T cell receptor. So my FASTAQ file already contain um, these T cell receptor reads, either alpha or beta, and the reads are already collapsed by the unique molecular identifier. So what my data looked like is I pretty much had a sequence. It could have been alpha or beta. And I have a unique molecular identifier associated with it and also a droplet barcode. The droplet barcode is when uh, you encapsulate any given cell into a emulsion droplet, each of the droplets have their own barcode. So you, we use that barcode to later identify which alpha and which beta came from that same droplet. So that's also included in the FASTQ file. And how long are these uh, chains or the RNAs coding these chains? Are they short enough to be covered by a single sequencing read? Um, so I think, um, if I remember correctly, this was paired and sequencing. So there were two primers, one on the one end of the um let's say beta chain and the other one on the other end, and then they end up connecting in the middle. So, um, and also the technology used for this was MySeq. So they tend to have this um, a f a capacity for doing longer reads. So that's how it worked. So we ended up, they ended up engineering the two sides together in the middle and the output, I didn't have to do this. The output was already provided to me. Mm -hmm. so that's high. So basically, you have uh, did you say two hundred thousand uh, different cells, and you have uh, basically two transcripts from each cell. Is that how it works? One for the alpha yes. and one for the beta yes. chain. So right. originally, my FASTAQ files contain many more reads, many more transcript reads than that. Um, but sometimes it happens that for a given cell, only a beta is sequenced or only an alpha is sequenced uh, in a high quality manner. So we end up dropping those cells and only keeping the ones that we have both alpha and beta information for. So that's the 200,000 is already the both chains of it. Yeah. But originally we had many more reads than that. And uh, within a single cell, uh, did you ever observe any diversity in, in those transcripts or are they always uh, completely identical? Oh, they're very heterogeneous. Um, so the way that T cell receptor is made, it's made in the thymus. And uh, we have a huge diverse repertoire in our bodies just simply because there's so many 
you know, bacteria and viruses that we need to fight against. And so we need um, a lot and lots of different T cell receptors in order to do so. So the way um, it's actually very interesting that if we were to have a um, um, one sequence for each T cell receptor, we would pretty much take up all of our DNA. So that would not be feasible. Um, so the way it works is that there are no, a number of genes and the different combinations of genes make up a T cell receptor. So for example, for the beta chain, there are genes called V for variable, D for diversity, and J for junction. And so uh, there is maybe, I think there is around 50 V genes and for beta chain and then 13 J genes and two D genes or, or along those numbers, maybe now there's more. Um, but the way it works is that um, for each beta chain, whenever the T cell is produced, um, one V gene is selected supposedly randomly. Then the D gene is selected and the J gene is selected again randomly. And then in the junctions where the, for example, where the V D V gene connects to G D gene, there is also random repair going on in that junction side, plus some insertions and deletions. So the total estimate theoretical diversity, given these different constraints and insertion deletion rate and number of genes um, for both alpha and beta combinations is uh, about 10 to the 15. So that's how many unique T cell receptors we could have in our body. In our body, we only have reportedly from 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 T-cell receptors, well, T-cells with their receptors. So, uh, but we can have any of the sequences from that 10 to the 15 in our bodies. So whenever I look at any given cell, it's very varied which T-cell receptor it will have. And some T-cell receptors uh, I only see one time, and there are some T-cell receptors that are very expanded, proliferated, maybe they... The person encountered some disease just recently, maybe had a flu, and then I would observe a certain T cell receptor multiple times in a given sample. Right. So that that's when you look across all the cells that that you have. But uh, one, uh, if you look at at a single given cell and you look at the multiple mRNA transcript from that cell, are they all identical, or uh, are are there sometimes small differences between them? So the way I get my data is I already have my transcripts collapsed. So I really only see one transcript, one alpha and one beta. So I can't really see if um, there's any difference between the transcripts in the cell. And even if I were able to see that and I saw differences, I wouldn't know if it was because maybe sequencing error or if it was any like a biological thing. So one thing I thought about is that uh, because we have uh, two chromosomes, right, two of each homologous chromosomes, then uh, we essentially have two copies, one of which is supposed to be silenced. But yes. uh, maybe if you sequence enough, you'll maybe see tiny glimpses of that uh, supposedly inactive copy. Yes. So um, I can answer this question is that when the T cell is developed, so there is these um, V, D and J gene recombinations happening uh, during the production of the T cell. First, there is a beta chain rearrangement. And if the so there's only one allele that's undergoing this beta chain rearrangement. And once that's done, if the beta chain is productive, so it can produce a productive T cell receptor. There's no, you know, shifts or anything like that, uh, frame shifts. Um, then the other allele for the beta chain is silenced. So it doesn't undergo the beta chain rearrangement anymore, as far as we know. For the alpha chain, once the beta chain is produced, then there is an alpha chain rearrangement. And for the alpha chain, it's reported that both alleles actually recombine. So you end up getting both alpha chains recombined, but then later there is some selection processes. So even if the full productive T cell receptor is made, it might still not pass a selection process. It could maybe not have very high affinity to anything, so that would be useless. Or it could 
it might have too big of an affinity to our own cells that are not a foreign cell. And so in that sense, in that case, we could uh, result in some severe autoimmune diseases. So that would our T cells would attack our own healthy cells. So after passing those selections, most of the time, only one alpha and one beta chain receptor is made. So the other alpha chain that's also recombined is is not doesn't pass the selection, so it's not there. Um, it is also reported that in thirty percent, around thirty percent of the cases, twenty to thirty percent of the cases, depending on where you look, a given T cell will have two alpha chains successfully recombine and pass the selection. But for our case, because when you encapsulate T cells into emulsion droplets. We do it at a Poisson process to ensure that there is one only one T cell per droplet every time. But Poisson process is not entirely without flaws in that sense that sometimes, and in our case, around 10% of the time, we will see a droplet that will have two T cells incorporated in it. So because um, we, let's say we see in a T cell two alpha chains rather than one, with the same droplet barcode. So that could be one of the two scenarios. One is that we had two T cells incorporated into that droplet, and then one alpha chain came from one T cell, another alpha chain came from another T cell. Or another scenario is that there are actually two recombined alpha chains in a single T cell. And that could be because um, it passed, both chains passed the selection. And so the T cell potentially has two receptors. However, because we couldn't differentiate between these two scenarios, we ended up excluding those T cells from our data set. So we did see quite a quite a number of the T cells that had both two alpha chains or even two beta chains, which shouldn't happen, but that could have been because we had two T cells in a droplet. And so for our purposes, we ended up excluding all of those uh, T cells that had more than one alpha or more than one beta chain inside them. Right, so you get this data set of various alpha and beta sequences for each cell. And then uh, did you sort of know in advance what you were going to do with them? Or did you like look at the data and thought, well, what, what sort of interesting insights can I draw from this? So when I joined the lab, there was uh, already another person working on this. Um, so my colleague, Jason Carter, he is an MD-PhD student at Stony Brook. And so he started looking at the data first. And what he saw is that um, the alpha-beta pairs follow this distribution called a parallel. And that already was reported previously in uh, a single chain, but uh, he ended up also finding that in the uh, with the pair chains. Um, so we all, when I joined the lab, we already knew that um, the pair chains also follow this power law. And after he went back to medical school uh, and I joined the lab, I ended up picking up the project. So I already had some uh, pre-existing knowledge about the data. Um, which made things a bit easier for me. And then after that, I just kind of went along with what I found and what I found interesting. And um, all of the rest of the analysis that I did just kind of came out as I went with um, advice from my uh, PhD mentor um, and um, other people along the way. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to say that uh, these sequences follow the power law. Okay, so the power laws are um, a very interesting thing in that sense that they're everywhere. Uh, I never knew about it before uh, I started working on this. And now that I know a lot about them, I pretty much see them everywhere now. Um, So what a power law is, the way I like to explain it, um, even in my scientific presentations, I give an example of a Shakespeare play. So if you take a Shakespeare play, let's say you take Hamlet, and you count how many times each word is used in that play. And then you take the 
most used word and then plot it on, um, you just plot from the most, you rank them from the most used word to the least used word. And if you plot that, each word on the x-axis, you plot the rank of the word. So number one, meaning the most common word and the last one, meaning the least common word. And on the y-axis, you plot how many times you see that word. And if you make the scale log-log scale, so both x and y-axis are on a log scale, you will observe a very nice straight line. So that means that uh, it's a power law. So the power law is pretty much an equation of y equals x to the power of gamma, right? And that's a power law. And so that's a very completely unrelated biologic, not, not related to biology example. And this kind of distribution we observe in many places. For example, cities, city sizes follow the power law. City population sizes follow the power law. Um, so my T cell clone size distribution follows a power law. So if I look at my T cell receptors that I have in my sample and count how many time that each of that receptor I see, um, so there is going to be a lot of receptors that I only see once, and there's going to be a few receptors that I see many, many times. So if I plot that distribution the way I explain the Shakespeare example, I would also get that straight line on a log-log scale. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify one small thing. So I think there are two alternative ways to describe, uh, or probably there are more, uh, to describe a power law. And uh, what you were talking about originally, the relationship between the uh, rank of the word and its frequency, right? That's, uh, I think it's called Ziff law. Yes, that's correct. And, and uh, there the relationship is, is simpler. It's, uh, I think it's like so something like the frequency is inversely proportional to the rank. Mm -hmm. But if you turn that, but that's if you can calculate the rank. Mm -hmm. the, an alternative way to approach it is instead of calculating ranks, you just... Uh, consider simply the distribution of the frequencies yes. and you say the higher the frequencies the, the the smaller the probability of observing it and the relationship between the the frequency and the probability of observing that frequency is the power law meaning that the probability uh, is proportional to the frequency to the power of gamma yes so so just not to confuse the, those two things because they are related. I think mm -hmm. they, they're describing the same underlying probability distribution, but one way to describe it is in terms of the ranks, and yes. the other is in terms of the distribution of the, I guess, cluster yes. sizes. So the way I like to say it is that, yes, you're you're right. The, the rank way of doing things is called Ziff's Law. Um, and then what we do with T-cells, we're, instead of just plotting the counts of the word on the y-axis, we actually count how many times we see the count. <laughs> so I like it to call it counts of counts, kind of, or frequency of counts. And then the count goes down to the x-axis, and then the frequency of that count goes to the y-axis. So for our T-cell example, we're doing the so-called counts, counts of counts. And um, that's still a that still remains a power law. And what's actually interesting is that if I take um, some, you know, very big sample, let's say I have a sample of a million things, can be anything, um, could be T-cells, could be, for example, um, uh, how many times a given tweet was liked. Um, so likes of tweets also follow power law. Um, so let's say if I have a huge sample size and then I take the counts of counts, I get the power law. But then if I count the counts of counts, I still get a power law and I can do it many, many times. And no matter how many times I count the counts of the counts, I remain in the power law. So I thought that was very interesting. And I kind of accidentally discovered that um, while I was playing with the, some data. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so another thing, I guess, to, to note about the power law, because it may seem like very abstract, so you have some kind of formula with a power in it. So the significance, I guess, of this formula is if you compare it to other distributions, so things like the normal distribution or the 
um, exponential distribution, mm -hmm. they decay very quickly because they're an exponential with a negative power. So this is why the range of values that you can observe is pretty narrow. But the function x to the power of something, to the power of gamma, it grows. Uh, if gamma is positive, it grows slower than an exponential. And if gamma is negative, it falls slower mm -hmm. than the exponential. And, and this is why for very large values, you still have relatively high probability of observing it. And this is why the range of the power law distribution is typically much, much larger than for other distributions. That, that's why sometimes called a heavy tail distribution because mm -hmm. it decays relatively slowly compared to the uh, various exponential distributions. Yeah, I will, if you, that's that applies if you have a low exponent. So the lower the exponent, the heavier the tail. If you have exponent that's pretty high, let's say exponent of four, you'll actually have a very low probability of observing anything above 10 on an x-axis. Mm -hmm. That's something I also discovered by just playing around. <laughs> oh, um, I can tell you another interesting thing. Go ahead. Um, so another thing that um, power law resembles is something called a Pareto distribution. Um, so Pareto distribution um, is pretty much like a power law, and it kind of says that... Um, 80% of uh, the problems are caused by 20% of the causes. So, for example, 20% um, of the richest people owe 80% of the earth wealth. Or 20% um, of bugs cause 80% of software problems. So that's another thing. So in a way, with the TESOL example... It means that about 80% of our TESA repertoire consists of only 20% of some TESA receptors uh, in terms of diversity. So I thought that was also kind of interesting and something you can infer from the power law as well. Right. So, so what is the biological basis of that sort of inequality? How come that the, let's say, 20%, but I guess the, I guess the specific... Uh, figure of 20% and 80% would depend on the power of the power law? Yes. But like, how come that the minority of T-cell receptors dominate the the whole population? Uh, so that's something that uh, nobody really knows. So for any, whatever power law you look at, whether it's in biology, whether it's in economics or, uh, you know, geography, nobody knows why they happen. So we don't know that in case of T cells either. The only there are some explanations that could be possible, but these are the kind of explanations that oh, they could be right because they make sense. There is no really like theoretical proof for them. Uh, in terms of T cells, I guess biologically, in a way, it makes sense to me that uh, a huge uh, fraction of the population is only a few T cells or twenty percent of the T cells. Um, is because probably of the history of it has to it has to do something it must have to do something with evolution probably is that certain pathogens are very common that humans get exposed to well um, others are not and so maybe humans built up this kind of repertoire um, there's no there's absolutely no biological explanation that's proven in any way is just my uh, speculations right now okay i kind of expected the answer to be uh, it's just the clonal expansion but maybe that's more complicated than that it's probably more complicated than that um in terms of t-cells there's many different types of t-cells as well um so for example there is a, a cd4 and cd8 t-cell cd4 t-cell is uh, another way called a helper t-cell and a CD8 T cell is called a killer T cell. So usually, when you have an infection, the helper T cell recruits the is the first uh, the helper T cell is the first one to react, and it recruits the killer T cell, and then the killer T cell does the the fighting. And um, so the killer T cells are the ones that have a higher rate of proliferation, and so they're 
probably more likely to be at the tail or will follow a more heavily tail distribution with a lower exponent. Um, so this could be one explanation that um, uh, there are some, you know, T cells that proliferate various rates given an infection, and then some T cells uh, have a less proliferative rate, and somehow it comes together in a way that it follows a power law. Another type of T cells are memory T cells and naive T cells. So naive T cells are the ones that never encountered um, a pathogen before. So they usually tend to be in very low clone sizes just simply because they didn't have an opportunity or reason to proliferate. And then memory T cells are the ones that have encountered uh, a pathogen before, and then our body wants to remember that T cell just in case we have the same encounter again. And so that T cell tends to stay at a, a slightly higher um, clone size uh, just in case it will need to um, perform again. Um, but another interesting thing about the T cell case is that the, as I mentioned earlier, the power law on a log log scale appears as a straight line. And that's how you can suspect that it's a power law. Um, in the T cell case, the power law actually deviates slightly from the straight line on a log scale. And at first we thought maybe it's just noise. But then, um, again, I was playing with the data, uh, playing with some simulations uh, one day, and then I decided, I don't remember why I decided to do this, I decided to just simulate two power laws of different exponents and combine them together and see what I get. Do I still get a power law or do I get something else? And I still get a power law, what I think is a power law, but it's there's a slight deviation from that straight line. And then I noticed that it's a very similar deviation from the straight line as my T cell um, case, my T cell power law. So then I thought, wow, maybe Maybe the T cell receptors follow a mixture of power laws. Maybe there is more than one power law in there. Um, and so that kind of led to led us to explore uh, mixtures of power laws. And actually, when we thought about it uh, more deeply, is that the different types of T cells present in our bodies uh could potentially explain why there is a mixture of power law because there could be different generative processes. So for some T cells, they're more likely to proliferate while other T cells tend to stay in low sizes and that could lead to existence of two power laws. And since we didn't differentiate between the T cells, between the types of T cells, we ended up looking at the whole thing in one go. And so... Um, we didn't separate them by type, so we couldn't separate the power laws. But we don't know whether this, what I'm saying now, is true um, just because we don't have the information for cell types. Um, and But that that's to be determined in the future. But that was something completely novel that we saw that there's a distribution out there that is a power law. But in fact, it's not a single power law. It's more than one power law. Interesting. And I guess the reason why you couldn't check within the subpopulations of T cells, like separately CD4 T cells, is that you did this targeted RNA sequencing. So if you did the whole RNA sequencing, you could presumably cluster them by type, right? And look within the cluster. Well, so actually for CD4 and CD8, we did have that information. Okay. Um, so the way it worked um, in sequencing is that they use these um, barcoded antibodies. So CD4 and CD8, these are surface proteins. So you can get an antibody to bind to, let's say, a CD8 surface protein and um, get encapsulated along with a cell. And then you can have a barcoded antibody um, attached to the CD8 protein and then sequence that barcode of the antibody and then determine whether the T cell is a CD8 T cell or a CD4 T cell. So we actually had that information in our data. Um, not all of the T cells successfully um, carried that along with them during the sequencing. So when we divided the T cells by CD4 and CD8, the sample size decreased quite a bit. Uh, so we didn't. We no longer had 200,000. But we still managed to look at 
individual power loss for CD4 population and a CD8 population. Um, and we did see that CD8 population tend to have a lower exponent compared to uh, the CD4 T cell population, which again makes sense because um, CD8 T cells tend to proliferate more. So in that sense, this suggests that maybe one of the reasons for the mixture of power loss is that CD8 T cells proliferate more. But within those two populations, both CD4 and CD8, the best uh, model to fit is also a two power law model. Um, so we calculated, um, the best model was calculated using this thing called Bayesian information criteria. And um, so we found that the better model is a two power law model. And another thing, so that's, um, there's the package that I created to determine this. We could also determine what weight each power law takes up. So when we observe two power loss in uh, the full population, we see that about, um, I think, 10% of the uh, distribution is a power law with a lower exponent. And then the remaining 90% of the distribution is a power law with a higher exponent. For CD4 uh, T cell population, only 1% of the distribution is the lower power law exponent, so the heavier tail uh, one. And then the rest, 99% of the population is um, is um, the power law of a um, higher exponent. For the CD8, we observe a higher weight of the lower power law exponent. So again, we have 10% of one power law and 90% of the other power law um, and so this suggests that there's also the difference in how much each of the power law take up in CD4 versus CD8. And both CD4 and CD8 have memory and naive cells, but, um, and I'm not too familiar yet um, on what's exactly the percentage of memory and naive within a given population, but CD8 T cells, um, I would think, would have potentially a higher number of memory T cells than CD4. But I'm actually not sure about that, no. Um, so there's differences um, in what's the combination of different mixtures in CD4 and CD8. But since we don't have memory and naive information, we can't really continue dissecting the population even further. But again, if you had a full RNA full transcriptome profile of the cells, couldn't you then try to separate the memory and naive cells based on the gene expression profile? Yes. So this could be a strategy to, to use uh, just to do the whole transcriptome and then extract T cell receptors, memory or naive transcripts um, or whatnot. Um the problem with that is that we would need, we would probably need much more coverage to do this because we want to recover our T cell receptors as accurately as we can because um, that's the best way to determine clonality of the repertoire if we only have sequences that are very, very accurately sequenced. And the only way we can have that if we have a lots of lots of reads for a given T cell receptor chain. If we do a whole transcriptome, then all those reads would distribute among many different transcripts, a lot of transcripts that we don't probably don't care about, um, for at least for this given project. Um, so that's why this, this scenario or this, um, this protocol would not have worked for us because we could have potentially missed a lot of T cell receptors. And this would have been probably much more expensive since we would have needed a much bigger coverage for the sequencing. So I see. Yeah. But there's other strategies to to get the, you know, CD4 and CD8 information the way we did in, in this project or for memory naive. Actually, in the next project that I'm doing, we are um, extracting memory naive information, again, using this antibody technique where we attach the antibody to a surface marker and then see which surface marker it attached to, whether it's memory or naive or or CD4, CD8. So there is other ways to extract 
this information without sacrificing the T cell receptor quality. And since you have the information on the alpha and beta chains of the T cell receptor, then I guess you decided to investigate the the relationship between the two. And you already mentioned that the consensus was to pay attention to only one of them. Mm -hmm. How exactly did you find the link between the two? So the main idea for uh, the paper was really to compare the uh, paired T cell receptors to their individual chains. So the way I did this um, was I I had my, you know, 20,000, 200,000 alpha beta pairs. And then I took my data set and also split it by chain. So I don't um, have a change in sample size. Sample size changes, stays the same. And I just have uh, three pretty much data sets, one for the pairs and then one for the alpha and one for the, for the beta. And so then I wanted to perform um, same analysis for each um, uh, data set that I now have, each of, each of the three data sets, and then compare what kind of answers I get. So usually people only look at the beta chain and assume whatever conclusions they make, these are correct conclusions. So my way, this way of doing things the way I did it was to just directly compare what answer we get from just the beta chain or just the alpha chain to the answer we get from the paired. And uh, the first thing I did is I kept uh, exploring the power laws. So I it was a very simple um, idea is just to uh, fit the power law distributions of paired and then compare them to the fits of only alpha chain and only beta chain. So this idea that if um, the pairing of the chains is completely independent and looking just at the beta chain is uh, an accurate way of doing things, then those power laws should pretty much be the same. Maybe a little bit of noise, but... Uh, they should mainly have the same exponent and really no significant differences. But that's not really what I saw. In fact, when I looked at um, uh, the pairs, as I said before, I observe a double power law so that a model of two power laws is a better model than a single power law. For the beta and alpha chains, that was not the case the better model was a single power law model. So that's a pretty significant difference. And that was the pretty much the first analysis I did that really showed that the paired um, uh, the paired data set is a much better um, way of looking at uh, T cells. And that makes sense because when you only have a beta chain, you pretty much have half of the receptor. Uh, and you assume that the other half is not important. And this pretty much suggests that the other half is important. Um, another thing that we did was to look at the number of alphas one beta chain pairs with. So we take um, a given beta chain, one beta chain, and then go through the data set and see how many times that beta chain pairs with some other alpha chain in another T cell receptor. And then if the pairing is independent, um, the most likely outcome of this should be that um, pretty much all of the beta chains only pair with one alpha chain. So, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I follow. So if, if pairing is truly independent, then every alpha chain and every beta chain should have like an equal probability to pair with each other, right? That's what independence means? Uh, yes. But because there are so many of um, potential combinations for alpha or beta, it's very unlikely that the same beta is going to be generated in two T cells um, more than once or twice. Uh-huh. So, so you're saying... If we are observing the same beta in two different cells, mm-hmm. then it cannot be by chance. Uh, they have to be descendants of the same clonal expansion. So it can't be. 
So the only way it can be a descendant of the same clonal expansion if it has identical alpha and beta chain. Right. And here I'm talking about the beta chains that are a same beta chain in two different cells and they pair with different alphas or other way around. Uh, right, right, right. A single alpha pairing with two different betas in different cells. Yeah, so so therefore they're, they're not independent, right? Yeah. Is, is that what we're saying? That's what we're think it is, that they're not entirely independent. And the independence could come from many different ways. Maybe, um, you know, some um, some alpha-beta pairs are not likely to be a good T-cell receptor. So if the T-cell production is unsuccessful, then uh, our bodies just keep producing T-cells that are successful. And maybe, you know, this kind of selection also lowers the uh, estimated diversity or estimated potential for diversity rather uh, of what T cells, what kind of T cells could be generated because the uh, production of T cells happens before they get exposed to any pathogen. So they don't know what they will need to fight against. So the body just pretty much generates a ton of different T cells, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Presumably randomly. And we think that this generation of T cells, uh, including the pairing of alpha and beta chains, may not be as random as thought before. Um, we don't have direct, you know, experimental proof for it or anything like that, but our analysis kind of suggests that this could be the case. And so there is a dependency between the alpha and the beta chains, but so they are neither completely independent, nor um, one of them determines the other one, right? Some somewhere in between, there's like sort yes. of correlation. So there's we don't know. Um, so as of now, it is widely believed that the pairing is completely independent. There's different compartments in the thymus where the uh, chain recombination happens. So the beta chain recombination happens in a compartment different from the one where the alpha chain recombination happens. So as far as um, current knowledge tells us is that the recombination of the, the chains should be independent. Um, but we, I have reason to believe based on my experience, uh, with this data and, you know, pretty much working every day on it, that I don't think this is as simple as independent. So there has to be something more than that, because if if it's only independent, then we wouldn't be seeing what I have seen in this data. Okay, so, you, so basically you have now a result that um, more or less completely overthrows what previously was believed. And also, we have no idea why it happened. So it sounds like a a great starting ground for a very successful research career. Um, uh, hopefully, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, like a, a lot of questions to answer here. Yeah, it's a bit of a controversial idea, you know, because so much work has been built upon these assumptions, you know, that the, the pairing is independent and so much work has been done only on the beta chain, including work in um, uh, medical fields, for example, uh, for, you know, cancer immunotherapy, a very hot topic right now. They just uh, Cancer immunotherapy just got a Nobel Prize this year. And a lot of the work that's done, you know, in clinical trials is only looking at the beta chain. And I guess the message that I'm trying to um, tell here is that maybe we should, you know, be more responsible in the sense of making those assumptions. And I actually show that looking at the pairs is a much more accurate way of, you know, doing this kind of science. And um, maybe, you know, there should be a move from this uh, established bulk beta chain sequencing to uh, single cell sequencing, especially given that recent technologies has been growing very rapidly. I, I guess one thing I don't quite understand here is that if people believe that a pairing of an alpha and beta chains is independent, so meaning any alpha chain could be paired with any beta chain, then 
I don't see how it follows that, like how they justify it looking only at the beta chain, right? If you believe that they're independent, then the pairing of alpha and beta carries the uh, added information of alpha plus the information of beta, right? Yes. Um, and so that would be like if people believe that, that would be only an argument for looking at both of them. Yes. So I think when while this T cell repertoire field was developing, it was very hard and very expensive to do single cell sequencing. It still is quite expensive. So I think a scientist didn't really have a choice. Um, that's the best that could have been done. And um, the reason, um, you know, they do beta chain is because beta chain has a selection from three types of genes, while alpha chain only has a selection from two types of genes. So beta chain has V, D, and J genes. Alpha only has V and J. Um, and also, um, it's previously reported that the beta chain is the chain that has these insertions and deletions in the junction size, while uh, Alpha is believed not to have those extensive insertions and deletions, and that makes the beta chain much more variable than the alpha chain. And because it's, uh, you know, so many different combinations that can be made given all these constraints, it's supposed to be a very low probability of observing, you know, uh, one alpha chain pairing with different beta chains in different cells and other way around. And so that led to this assumption. But that's the assumption is purely based on the belief that it's there is this independence, right? And that the um, uh, a given beta chain, it's a very low probability that the same beta chain will be generated in two different T cells. And we see that that happens a lot. Um, another interesting, actually, another interesting result that we saw was... <clears throat> Um, T cells that were shared among individuals. So, for example, um, assuming that there is, you know, 10 to the 15 possible alpha beta pairings, and humans only have 10 to the 11 T cells in the human body, it's very unlikely that two unrelated individuals will have the same T cell just because. You know, you have a probability of generating any given T cell is, you know, one over 10 to the 15 and you only have 11, 10 to the 11 T cells in the human body. So it's, you know, very close to zero probability that the same T cell will be generated twice in unrelated individual or even within the same individual. And um, we observe paired alpha betas among different individuals, different unrelated individuals. And if this independence assumption, you know, uh, is correct and um, we shouldn't see that, um, even given the number of possible combinations, we shouldn't see that. The probability of observing these two sequences is so low that, and we see way more than the probability su su suggest. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece of result that suggests that there has to be something more in the way these T cells are generated and the way the alpha beta are paired together. Right. I guess this could also be explained if the combinations of different segments is sort of non-uniform. It's random, but some combinations are more likely than the others. And there may be a few combinations that are like super popular or super mm -hmm. frequent? Yeah. So if you only look at the genes, um, then um, you will see that some genes are more likely to get selected than others. And that could be, for example, maybe, you know, when the T cell is, when the T cell receptor is folded into the protein, uh, maybe, you know, certain gene combinations don't really fold well, you know, into a stable protein. So, you know, those combinations are not favored. However, when we consider, you know, um, a T cell receptor, we also consider the junction sites. So actually the junction sites are the most important sites of the T cell in that sense that 
that's the site that recognizes the pathogen. So that's not only the genes, that's also insertions and deletions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the region called uh, uh, a complementarity determining region or a CD3 region. Um, and so we take the, that full CD3 region to determine a T cell receptor. So, and that's another thing is that it's not only gene selection, it's also the randomness of insertions and deletions. And the insertions and deletions are believed to be completely random. And if that's the case, if those insertions and deletions are indeed random, then again, we shouldn't see shared T cell receptors among unrelated individuals. And the fact that we do see that um, also suggests that maybe, maybe those insertions and deletions are not as random or, you know, something is going on there that causes certain combinations happen more frequently than others. Yeah. And, and speaking of alpha and beta chains, you also had an interesting observation about how the pairing of alpha and beta um, affects the, the specificity of the receptor to like different epitopes. Oh, yes. So, um, so that's kind of been known for a while in mice. People have done, you know, mutation experiments where they, took a T cell receptor and changed one amino acid on the alpha chain and observed a completely, you know, changed specificity to a, a given epitope. What I did with my data is um, there is this database that exists right now online. It's a vdjdb.net uh, or something like that. It's a T cell receptor database. And it has um, some paired T cells from other single cell experiments and uh, a lot of single chain um, alpha or beta uh, sequences there that you can look up. And also all of these uh, sequences have a specificity information. So maybe they were um, determined using these tetramer assays where they, you know, put in a given epitope and then pulled all the T cells that reacted to it and sequenced them. And this way they knew which pathogen is that T cell specific to. And so what I did is I took my data and looked into that database to see if there's any T cells in there that I also have in my data set. And I found um, quite a few of them. So I looked at uh, both at the paired level and also the single chain level. So again, I did the same thing. I took all of my paired T cell receptors and then looked how many of the paired T cell receptors I see in the database. So I found five, five that are shared between the database and mine. Um, that's again, another thing, um, we should, I shouldn't have seen that given that the recombination is completely random, right? Um, so that's kind of a reprodu reproducibility thing. Like I reproduced that with a completely different data. So that was another thing that was really cool. But I also, what I also did is again, I split the, my data set by chain and I also split all the paired sequences that I saw in the database also by chain. And then I saw what I would find. Do I find any shared, um, sequences only at the alpha and the beta chain? Um, so what I found was very interesting. I actually found much more only single alpha or single beta that are shared between my data set and the database. So then I looked at the um, uh, epitope species that those T cells are specific to. So if I take a, one individual and there was one individual that shared uh, T cells at the paired alpha and beta chain level with a database and those T cells were specific to influenza A, which is just a general flu virus and EBV. These viruses are very common viruses uh, that a lot of people have T cells reactive to those viruses. But then if I look at single chain level, either alpha or beta chain, all of a sudden I see that the same person that had the EBV and influenza A now also has HIV, yellow fever, cancer, um, and a bunch of other viruses. And, you know, if we were to use our T cell receptor sequencing for, you know, maybe diagnosing, just hypothetically speaking, it's not done right now or anything, but if we were to do that, just to use half of the receptor, so only the beta chain to determine what kind of virus that person is exposed to, 
So if we only looked at the beta chain, we would conclude that the person has all of these horrible diseases and that would be quite unfortunate for that person. But if we look only at, if we look at both pairs, uh, both, um, if we look at both alpha and beta chain together, then we only see influenza A and EBV, which makes, makes much more sense and uh, is a, actually a common thing to see in the individual. So that was a pretty striking result com- when comparing alpha and beta pairs to just a single chain. Mm-hmm. But but that's only assuming that you know your cells are memory cells, right? Be- because if, if those are naive cells, you cannot make the assumption that the person actually encountered the, those viruses. Yeah, that's actually a good question. I never thought about that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to answer it fully. Uh, I guess yeah, we would have to know. We would have to know the memory naive information. But um, I think in our case, when you sample a T cell, so we sample T cells from a peripheral blood. So we're probably much more likely to sample a memory T cell over a naive T cell. Yeah, because memory T cells are at higher clone sizes, so it's a much higher chance that the T cells I looked at were in fact memory. Um, but yeah, the only way we can answer this question is to actually know the cell type. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so so one uh, conclusion you reached was that the alpha and beta chains are not independent. Um, any other? Uh, results from from the paper that you want to talk about? Not from the paper. I have um, a really cool but very anecdotal example that we didn't include in the paper just because it was anecdotal. Um, But I always share it in my talks. So one of the things that I noticed originally in our data set, we had six people, six healthy people. And healthy here means that uh, they don't have cancer and they don't have autoimmune disease. So they shouldn't have these, you know, random expansions um, related to cancer or autoimmune disease. And in our final um, paper that we uh, we put on uh, on the bioarchive, was, there were only five individuals. Uh, the sixth one wasn't there. And the reason for that was because when we looked at the power law distributions of each of the individuals separately, we found something very strange with the power law of that sixth individual. The strange thing was that that individual had huge expansions, so much bigger expansions than any other individual. And the power law was looking kind of weird in that there were very few um, data points at the head of the power law. So, you know, uh, clone sizes of one, two, or three, uh, they were there, but then there was a huge gap, and then there were only a few data points of these very high clone sizes. And so we found that there has to be something going on going on with that person, and we actually ended up reaching out uh, back to the company that we were collaborating with and who did all the you know blood collection and everything like that and we asked whether they know anything about that individual and if there is anything you know going on with that individual and they told us that they found traces of hepatitis C in the blood so we thought that was really cool you know in that sense that we could see that maybe something is going on just simply looking at the parallel distribution of that individual. Um, so then we just assumed that that individual was not healthy. And so we ended up excluding it from our analysis. But I still share this in every talk that I do. And I show that the power loss in every talk that I do just because it's it's an interesting idea that those power loss could be used, you know, to potentially infer something going on with a person person's health yeah so in that case uh was it was it the case that the power law was a bad fit for for the data or was it a good fit but with a different exponent so the fit uh we didn't end up fitting that was um still back in the day when we weren't fitting power laws we were just kind of observing them Uh um but the way the power law looked was that 
there were, you know, three points at the head that were in a straight line. And then there was just a few points in the tail. So there were only very few, you know, these clone sizes that we could plot to begin with just Mm. because the sample was so dominated by these, you know, huge expansions that so it was kind of looking like a power law, you know, from a clone size of one to a clone size of three. But then after that, like, that was pretty much it. Then there was just these huge expansions. So uh, we think that had that person be healthy, um, we probably would have seen a much nicer looking power law. But because there was something going on there, there was this huge, huge deviation or, you know, the tail was so heavy that it completely dominated the, the power law. Right. By the way, when you identify uh, these uh, clone sizes, h- how do you cluster together the sequences? Do you have some kind of threshold of similarity that you that you allow, or do you consider identical sequences only? Yeah. So, so we look at these regions called CD three regions, right? The ones that I just described earlier, and um, the reason is because they are the ones that you know. Uh, are complementary to the pathogen um, epitope sequences, and so I looked at those at those regions, and I allow for one mistake. So if there is only one um, nucleotide difference between the CD3 regions of uh, two T cells, then I uh, assume these T cells to be identical. Uh, the only exception. Uh, for this was when I looked at the shared T cells among individuals. I wanted to reduce, you know, error as much as possible. So I only considered identical, you know, every single nucleotide is the same um, in that case, just because, you know, I didn't want to um, other people come back to me and say, oh, that's because maybe, you know, you were overcorrecting for sequencing error. So in that sense, that was, you know, only, I looked at only identical ones, but for the power loss and for estimating clone sizes, I allowed for one mistake, one one difference. And so for fitting power loss to the data, I think in, in this main paper, you use the maximum likelihood um, mm-hmm. procedure, which, which is basically finding the exponent that uh, maximizes the total likelihood. Total yes. probability, but you also wrote a Python package and uh, released a preprint describing it, where you do Bayesian inference of power laws. And can you talk about that and uh, why were you not satisfied with maximum likelihood? Um, so the reason we used um, maximum likelihood is because. Um, That was, you know, a a quick way of kind of getting the exponent. Um, However, when you use maximum likelihood, you only get one number. So let's say if I have my CD4 and CDA distributions, I will get one number for CD4 and one number for CD8. And then what do I do with these two numbers, right? Like I can't really compare them. I don't know what's the uh, certainty of these numbers. What's the confidence interval? And that was the flaw with the uh, maximum likelihood. With Bayesian inference, um, you actually sample the full posterior distribution. So not only you get, you know, the maximum, you only get the spread. So you get, uh, in our case, we were lucky to have a convex, you know, a distribution in that sense that we got like a nice one peak Gaussian. Um, so not only we could, you know, determine the mean of the Gaussian and get that number that's, we would have gotten the same number with maximum likelihood, but we also have a confidence interval now. So that would allow us to actually compare the two distributions together rather than two numbers together. Um, so that was the motivation for um, Bayesian inference. And uh, this type of fitting of power loss uh, didn't exist, or at least didn't publicly exist. Um, and I thought since power laws are everywhere, not just biology, and a lot of people are studying them in all types of fields, 
um, it could be a useful uh, tool for other people to use and uh, use Bayesian inference to fit those power laws without, you know, having to write the full algorithm themselves. And yeah, that's, that's why we did that as well. And uh, surprisingly, for some of the data sets, you found rather significant discrepancies between the maximum likelihood and the Bayesian uh, mean, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any ideas why or any explanations? Um, so it, there's a few times, um, a few scenarios where fitting using Bayesian inference worked better than maximum likelihood. Um, one was that the exponent, when exponents were very, very low, close to one, for some reason, the maximum likelihood would overestimate. So it would produce, it would estimate a higher exponent than it actually is. And that's, um, quite dangerous in that sense that a lot of power loss, most of the power loss actually, uh, have an exponent close to one. Um, and another case was if you have a very low sample size. So Bayesian inference will still do a pretty good job when you have as low as, you know, 10 data points, uh, which I couldn't believe that was successful, but <laughs> for some reason it was. And for maximum likelihood, um, with low sample size, it gets much more inaccurate if you have a high exponent. So depending on what kind of power law you have, sometimes using maximum likelihood would be sufficient and, you know, faster, and that's fine. Um, but there are some cases where you want to use Bayesian inference. And um, yeah, but yeah, I don't know why. I think the main reason the Bayesian inference was superior to maximum likelihood because it provides that spread, that confidence interval. Um, but I think doing maximum likelihood is, um, you know, not completely inaccurate in most of the cases because a lot of the cases you'll have high sample size and, you know, um, should be able to do well with maximum likelihood as well. For small sample sizes, it sort of makes sense that the Bayesian inference would work more robustly uh, mm -hmm. because you have a prior. I think you give it the Jeffries priors. Mm -hmm. And so you have this uh, penalization that doesn't allow it to go completely insane. But in general, if you have a Bayesian point estimate, such as the posterior mean or posterior mode, and if you have a maximum likelihood value, so so you said that the Bayesian values were more accurate, but how how do you judge which one is more accurate when they diverge? Uh, well, when when I did um, you know validation of my algorithm, I do simulations, so I simulate ah, I a power see. law where I know the right answer, right? So <laughs> that's how I know. <laughs> Uh, and and so even when you simulate, so initially I thought that w when you got uh, different estimates for two methods, it was because maybe the power law wasn't a great fit, and so there was sort of ambiguity of how to interpret the data. But you're saying even if you simulate and you draw your data from a perfect power law distribution, you still get the um, the discrepancies in, in the two methods? Well, the differences between maximum likelihood and Bayesian are actually not that big, right? Uh, the only exception to that is when I look at the very, very small exponents, exponents that are very close to one. Um, and I actually don't really know why that happens with maximum likelihood for me. But uh, with Bayesian, it doesn't happen. So <laughs> that's why... Um, for me, it seems better in that sense. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that you say the, the exponents are often close to one because those are very dangerous distributions, right? They don't have a mean value. So that means as you continue to draw from that distribution, your sample mean will become larger and larger in, in the in the limit. So like if you, if you observe a human body, <laughs> the... Uh, the counts of the cells will, will 
become sort of larger and, and larger as, as you continue observing it. If you didn't tell me that, I, I would imagine that uh, that would be, you know, a bit maybe biologically or physically impossible. But I think that, yeah, that happens as well. Oh, yeah. I think because there's always, you know, the tail is kind of like an outlier in a sense that there's, you know, very low frequency of these, you know, for example, in diesel case, high clone sizes, right? It's, um, there's only once that you'll see, you know, a clone size of a hundred of a thousand, for example. And, uh, many times you can see a clone size of 10 just because it's more likely to sample something 10 times than a thousand times. Right. Right. So, uh, but because there's always, you know, some like, for example, T cells that will be at such a high clone size that you will sample a lot of them, although rarely, um, that the parallel is bound to have a tail, like a heavy tail. Mm -hmm. And the heavier the tail, the lower the exponent. And this kind of makes sense that since you would always have the tail, so your exponent would always be low and close to one. Yeah, and and I guess, uh, I, I don't know how relevant this is biologically, but... Uh... When when thinking about like extreme outliers, because the, these power laws, especially with exponent less than two, they're bound to have huge outliers. And you could say that a cancer, like a lymphoma, would be one form of such an outlier. Mm. So like, yeah, if somebody has, yeah, cancer, it would probably have, you know, a T-cell clone size distribution even closer to power law, to to um it would have a clone size distribution parallel even closer to one exponent, right? I was saying that you can cause you could consider that as something drawn from the same distribution, mm -hmm. but you happen to reach that very far end of, of the tail, so you get a a very bad lottery ticket. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so I think we covered the uh the, the T cell receptors and, and the power loss and uh, is there anything else you would like to talk about? I think um what is um very interesting, you know, from from my work at least to me, was that um I went from, you know, something like T cells and learning about power loss in a you know, just in the T cell case. And now um, I think I mentioned that at the beginning. Um, I see them everywhere, right? Um, so since then, uh, I discovered more power laws that weren't seen before. So, uh, now we're trying to develop this, um, uh, single cell sequencing protocol, um, where we also use encapsulation, but um, we use this thing called um, multiplexing, where we, instead of using a Poisson process to uh, encapsulate T cells inside the uh, droplets, we uh, barcode samples and then um, overload the emulsion. So this way you can have multiple T cells in a droplet, but because the different samples are barcoded, we can distinguish whether it's, you know, a single T cell in a droplet or multiple T cells in a droplet because of those barcodes. So this is under development right now. And uh, we did a few pilot uh, runs for this, right? And uh, there were one pilot that wasn't very successful in the barcoding of the samples in that we got a lot of random barcodes from somewhere else. So we were supposed to have, you know, five barcodes that we should have seen and sequenced, but we got, you know, millions of barcodes that were completely different from the ones that we were supposed to see. So <laughs> what I did, I counted how many times I see each barcode and then plotted those frequencies of those counts. And I got a very nice looking power law. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I see parallels everywhere now, and the most fascinating thing about them is that nobody knows why. Yeah, you know, we see them in in T cell case, we see in, in a small sample. So maybe it's the way you know we analyze data. Maybe it's the way of you know humans looking at things rather than the actual phenomenon. And maybe that's just a simple explanation like that. Um, so like in T cell case, we only sample, you know, a small fraction of the total T cells in the human body. 
And so because of, you know, this kind of um, sampling, we a power law is just an artifact. But then there's examples where we do have the whole sample, the whole population, like, you know, in languages. So if you take, you know, every single word in the English language and count how many times the word is used in, in somewhere, let's say in this episode that we're doing right now, yeah. if we count each word, we have the full population, we have every single word, right? And we still see a parallel. So it can be just a sampling artifact. Well, I... I'm not sure I agree that that's the full population because the the episode itself is sort of a sample, right? We, we could have a different True. episode and yeah, or, or use different set of set of words on on a different day. True, um, but I mean, you can also try and you know take a full language. I guess you can't really determine how much time each word is used, you know, yeah. all over yeah, the it's, world. It's, it's still a sample, right? Yeah, but when you take, you know a play and you just want to understand the words used in just the play, like a Hamlet play, you don't just sample a f small fraction from that play. You use the whole play. So in that sense, it's the full population because that's the play you're interested in. You have the full, th the full population of that play. Um, and then another interesting thing is that, you know, language is something that, uh, you know, was created by humans. So it's not... It's not, you know, T cells, that's, you know, nature that's not really controlled by humans. Um, and then there's language that's controlled by humans or, you know, city populations and stuff like that. And these two things that one is controlled by humans, one is not controlled by humans, and it comes, you know, together in the power law, it's, I think is pretty cool um, and something to think about. And I think I read it somewhere that if we understand only one scenario of where the power law is coming from. Like if, if you know, uh, I somehow succeed to understand why T cells follow the power law, then we can potentially understand why there is a power law in every single case. Um, that's not my idea. Like we, I read that somewhere, but I thought that was really interesting. Like and maybe potentially understanding T cells could lead to understanding, you know, language or something like that. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I also thought about this, like if you contrast the power law with, let's say, a Gaussian distribution. So for a Gaussian, we know how it at least may arise if you sum up many independent um, observations or you average them out, you get a Gaussian in the limit. So we sort of know how that can be generated. For the power law, right, we, we don't know anything mm -hmm. similar there is this uh, scale free argument i can say i find it too convincing but the, the argument is that this is a special distribution that doesn't change if you rescale your variable oh yeah mathematically that's that's you can show that that you know yeah. if you rescale you still get the same answer but it's um, not clear why why would it apply in practice yeah the, the why is yeah the why is not clear um Actually, there's another thing that I did that's, uh, you know, not published or anything. But um, when I thought that, you know, the power law, I still kind of think that the power law could be an artifact, you know, just the way humans like to look mm -hmm. at things. You know, you do counts of counts. It's like a very special way of looking at things. And maybe it's just, you know, that's just the artifact of the way we analyze data. And I thought, what if, you know, if since I'm sampling a small fraction of T-cells, what if the actual distribution of T-cells, if you look at the whole 10 to the 11 T-cells, what if that's a Gaussian and when you subsample, you get a, you know, power law. So I tried uh, simulating a Gaussian and then playing around with it and trying to get a power law out of it. And I almost succeeded. <laughs> I got like a nice, you know, straight line on the log log scale at the head of the, of, of the, of the line at the head of the distribution. And then I got like a very messy, like not parallel like tail, um, but I don't know. I I thought you playing around a little bit more, maybe subsampling a bit more, you could turn a Gaussian into a parallel. I guess that means that we should be careful when we declare something to behave as a power law. We should have some kind of null hypothesis against which we test or or a set of hypotheses. So I saw this paper. It was about the power law, but um, the authors also gave some counterexamples. So the, the distributions that have a very wide range, 
Mm-hmm. So you might think they're power laws, but they're actually not. They resemble other distributions more. They don't quite follow the, the power law, but follow mm-hmm. some other distributions. Although from a general description, like there's these huge outliers, there are heavy tails, you might think it's a power law or might want to apply a power law to them. Mm-hmm. I guess, you know, like sometimes you could confuse maybe an exponential with a power law given, you know, what parameters the exponential has. Um, and maybe, you know, um, a combination of many, many, many exponentials could resemble a power law. Um, that's something that I guess I would have to, you know, simulate a bunch of exponentials and see if I can get something close to a power law. But that's something that could definitely happen, you know. Playing around with other distributions could, you know, lead to a power law. And yeah, so you have to be careful. I think when I was first learning about the power law, I was just, you know, Googling Ziff's law and power laws. And I think I came across this one um, um, entry, uh, some some web page with a title. So you think so you think you have a power law? <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> do you really have a power law or do you just think you have a power law? So, yeah, you have to be careful. And uh, there's definitely tests like statistical tests that um, people do to determine whether you know, it's really, you know, following that power law model or if it's deviating and how much is deviating from it and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool, Christina. Uh, It was a very interesting conversation. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, yeah, no problem. I was happy to, to do this. 